We have received permission from our uh, red-eyed friend to begin, and we'll, uh, we'll do that. Uh, we're beginning by singing hymn number 236, stanzas one and four. I picked this hymn for three reasons. One, there was no suggested hymn for anything in the middle of the book of Judges. Two, it's near Thanksgiving and this is a worship and praise hymn. Three, it does reference idols being trod under the foot of God. And, you know, that's fitting in, in what it is we're reading in Judges. So, uh, 236, 1 and 4 to start. <coughs> All praise to God who reigns above, the God of all creation, the God of wonders, power, and love, the God of our salvation, with healing balm my soul he fills, the God who every sorrow stills, to God all praise and glory. And for all who confess Christ's holy name, to God give praise and glory. All who the Father's power proclaim, to God give praise and glory. All idols underfoot be trod, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. To God all praise and glory. And we pray. Jesus, thank you for bringing us back together again today to study your word. Thank you for the presence of God the Holy Spirit to interpret your word for us, to comfort us with its message, and to encourage us to live Christian lives. As we consider Jephthah today, cause us to use him as an example of boldness and wisdom, but also to avoid his example of rashness. Uh, we pray, instruct us, feed us with your word, and uh, cause us to rejoice in the privilege of studying it. Amen. By the way, before I forget, no big secret to you, however, uh, we don't meet next week. It's Thanksgiving. Right about at this time, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be digging into a nice big turkey with our family. Right about this time of day. Isn't that right, hon? I think so, yeah. So, uh, so anyway, next session, December. Does it feel like it could be December in two weeks? December uh, 2nd. And uh, in the meantime, happy and blessed Thanksgiving. Where we're at today is Judges chapters 11 and 12. More or less the story of Jephthah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's a, a good one. Um, all, all the stories in the Bible are, but like last week, that's a little tougher slog, wasn't it? Um, you know, because there wasn't a lot of good news there. Jephthah, there's a lot more to grab onto there. Um, so we are working our way through the Judges, 12 of them in the book of Judges, 14 all together when you include Eli and Samuel. Uh, we've been through Othniel, Ehu, Deborah, Gideon. We are on Jephthah, who defeats Ammon. And uh, next up, Samson. So that'll be interesting. Uh, anyway, chapter 11 is where we're at. As you see, I will summarize the whole thing, reading for you 9 through 15 and 29 through 40. Um, here we go. Uh, so, in summary, starting with chapter 11, there was this fellow, Jephthah. And he was a, a, a strong and powerful warrior, a good military leader. But his lineage was questionable. He was, uh, he was the, the, the son of a, a nobleman named Gilead, but he was also the son of a prostitute. So the legitimate children of his father drove him away saying, uh, you're not going to have any inheritance, get lost. 
and as seems to have happened several times during the time of the judges, verse uh, 3, he gathers a worthless gang of guys around him and goes marauding. Uh, and that was in the area of Tob. This, by the way, is Gilead, uh, the foothills uh, rising from the Jordan River to the east of the Holy Land proper. That's Gilead. Tob seems to be uh, the, the, northern, the northern end of that. Then... Uh, the people, of course, have committed idolatry. God sends the Ammonites in so as to punish them. Uh, the Ammonites live right about here. They are making incursions into Gilead and even into Israelite territory, uh, Benjamin and Judah and Ephraim in, in here. And the people of Gilead particularly are suffering, and they call on Jephthah to come be their leader. And Jephthah says, get lost. That's what you told me. Get lost. No, you get lost. And they said, no, no, we're desperate. And he says, he says, nah, you know, you didn't want anything to do with me. But they kept prevailing upon him. Verse 9 tells uh, what happened. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me back to wage war against the Ammonites, and if the Lord hands them over to me, note how that's phrased. He knows the battle's the Lord's, and if he's going to win, it's going to be the Lord doing it. If the Lord hands them over to me, will I really become your head? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, may the Lord be a witness between us. And so they're calling on him as, as their witness. Uh, if we do not do just as you have said. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead. And the people appointed him head and chief over them. Jephthah repeated all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. There were several Mizpahs, but uh, it seems that this one was uh, in this area. I'm not even sure if it's. I'm not even sure if it's printed here, but uh, it seems that it was in this area. Then, verse 12, Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites. They said, what's the problem between me and you? So the messengers said, what's the problem between me, Jephthah, and you, the king of Ammon? And notice it's singular. Uh, notice he's taking, fully taking responsibility for the people of Israel, certainly the people of Gilead. Um, that's the mark of a good leader. What's the problem between me, Jephthah, and you, king of Ammon? Why have you come against me to wage war against my land? The king of the Ammonites said to Jephthah's messengers, the problem is that Israel took my land. We're going to learn. That was a bald-faced lie. Uh, when they came from Egypt, my land between the Arnon and the Jabbok extending to the Jordan. The Arnon was here. The Jabbok was here. And uh, the area in between, Ammon is saying, you took that from me. Uh, so now return the land peacefully. Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites. Here's what he said to the king. This is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take the land of Moab. And that's what really what it was more Moab's land properly there or the land of Ammon. And he went on to explain, you know, here's, here was the story. And, and now I'm, I'm summarizing, you know, everything uh, of what he said to the king of the Ammonites. He said, look, 300 years ago, which, by the way, kind of tells us when Jephthah lived, right about 1100, it seems. He was I, clearly at the tail end of the judges. So he says, 300 years ago, my people get out of Egypt, okay? And, and we wanted to pass peacefully through all these territories like Edom, uh, which was down here. Uh, a related people to the two of you, the Moabites and Ammonites, they came from Lot, so they were a cousin people to the Israelites, as were the Edomites, because, of course, they came from Esau uh, as opposed to Jacob. So Jephthah is saying to the king of Ammon, look, we, we came out of Egypt 300 years ago. We wanted peacefully to head through your lands. All was denied. So we end up taking on the kings on this side, uh, Sihon and Og, 
And, and our God, the true God, gave us that land. You're 300, two, 300 years too late to make this claim. God gave this land to us, the Lord of Israel. And, of course, the king of the Ammonites brushes it off. Uh, so, verse 29 is where we're picking it up. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Do not just read over that as if that's not that significant. It's quite significant that the spirit of the Lord came on him. This is, uh, this is something that's a repeated theme in Judges. Uh, the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. The spirit of the Lord's going to end up coming on Samson. Um, in the Old Testament, there were certain people on whom the spirit of the Lord came with miraculous power so as to get God's work done. Okay? And uh, it, particularly through the official process of anointing, there were prophets and priests and kings for, that, for which that was true. Uh, but as sort of proto-kings, uh, it was true of the judges, too. So the, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. He passed through Gilead and Manasseh. Um, so uh, Gilead over here, Manasseh was on each side of the Jordan. Then he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he went out against the Ammonites. Now we, we get the, maybe the most fascinating part of the chapter gets introduced. Jephthah had made a vow to the Lord. And remember, vows were big, big deals in the Old Testament. You did not break a vow to God, period. Okay. Uh, Jephthah had made a vow to the Lord. He said, if you indeed give the Ammonites into my hand, then whoever or whatever comes from the doors. And by the way, the, the direct translation is whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me. Uh, when I return in peace from the Ammonites, will belong to the Lord. And I'll offer it up as a whole burnt offering. He's obviously presuming this is going to be one of the animals. Okay, presuming it, I guess. And, and the, uh, the whole burnt offering, there, there were four different offerings among the Israelites, a sin offering, a guilt offering, a... Uh, uh, a fellowship offering, and then this whole burnt offering. The whole burnt offering was you, you take the whole animal, uh, it was all offered to God. The, the other ones, there were parts that went sometimes to the worshiper and, and uh, also to the, the ones offering it, you know, the, uh, the priests. But this one was, you know, whole burnt offering to the Lord, one of the more common sacrifices. That was Jephthah's vow. So, verse 32, Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to wage war against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. Jephthah struck them down from Aror all the way to the vicinity of Mineth, 20 cities as far as Abel Karamim, a great slaughter. And the, the picture is he beat them all the way into the southeast desert is, is what happened. Thus the Ammonites were humbled before the people of Israel. But when Jephthah came home to Mizpah, there was coming out to greet him his daughter. First thing, with drums and dancing in good Jewish fashion, you know. She was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. So as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothing and grief, cried out, Oh no, my daughter, you've, you've brought me to my knees. You've become a source of misery for me. I've opened my mouth to the Lord. I can't take it back. She said to him, My father, since you opened your mouth to the Lord, do to me exactly what came out of your mouth, since the Lord has carried out vengeance for you on your enemies, the Ammonites. She also said to her father, do this one thing for me, give me two months reprieve so that I may go into the mountains and weep for my virginity. And, and the sense is, okay, I, you know, I'm going to end up being, you know, being a, a, a virgin um, till the day of my death and, uh, and allow me to weep for that, I and my friends. Her father said, go, 
and he sent her away for two months. She and her friends went and wept over her virginity there on the mountains. When the two months came to an end, she returned to her father and he carried out the vow that he had made regarding her. She never was intimate with a man. This became a custom in Israel. From year to year, the daughters of Israel go out to hold a memorial service for the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days each year. Yeah. You were looking for law and gospel. Let's deal with that first. Uh, and then we can uh, deal with the rest of the chapter. So uh, the law, what, what was it in this chapter that you read uh, and, uh, and you said that, that convicts me of my sins? Maybe speaking Maybe. without thinking. That was, uh, that was mine. I, I trust all of us can relate to that, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, Jephthah spoke without thinking it through. Jephthah made a rash promise. In fact, it was worse because it was a vow. It used, a promise is one thing. A vow uses the name of the Lord uh, as, uh, you know, to be witness and help uh, to it. So if you've ever rashly promised something and then not come through, if you've ever rashly vowed to God something and didn't carry it out, if you can look at any of the vows that you have made and you said, I haven't always been perfect uh, in keeping that, then you're, you're condemned as a sinner like I am. And that's the law's work. Yeah. Anything else for law? I'm, I'm comfortable if that's where we, we leave it because I think that's kind of the glaring one in this chapter. Uh, how about gospel? Uh, where'd, you, uh, where'd you find the gospel? Jim. Well, just as the Lord gave him victory over the heathen, the Lord has also given us victory over our the greatest enemy of all. And, uh, it's his work entirely. Entirely right. Yep. I, I think that's the glaring one, isn't it? You know, uh, Jephthah got his victory over the Ammonites. He delivered God's people. They, they had a great slaughter. And uh, we had somebody worse than the king of Ammon opposing us, Satan, and we had somebody better than Jephthah delivering us, Jesus Christ. And he, he sent the enemies chasing, we've won the victory. Uh, count on that. Eric, your hand was up. I think in addition to that, uh, it really uh, states that I will sacrifice as a burnt offering to give thanks mm -hmm. for that. That is true. No doubt when he made his vow, it, his heart was full of sincerity saying, um, boy, if God does this for me, I'm all in on, on the Lord. And, uh, and uh, you know, any sacrifice evokes the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. That's gospel. Yeah, thank you. Now, did you happen to have any questions on this chapter? <laughs> um, Jim. Well, it, it appears as though there, there were two sins here. Uh, he, he made a rash vow, not knowing for sure what, what was going to happen. And then, after he makes the vow, he's got to kill his daughter. What, what about the Fifth Commandment? Let's talk about that. I, I thought you might ask about that, <laughs> you know. Um, the, by the way, this, uh, this particular thing, uh, to, to show you what, what uh, a, a dilemma of interpretation it is, um, at seminary, I remember in, in the, they call it an isagogics course, which, which is your introduction to, to what's written in the Bible. You're, you're exegetical, you're working in the original languages, you're isagogics, you're not digging quite as deep. And when we had it in the Old Testament, um, the, the professor assigned to us, you know, every, every controversy or every question of interpretation, he'd assign a paper to a couple of us and we'd have to do a presentation. And I, this was one of them. 
what you know what, what really happened here with Jephthah and daughter. So let's let's talk about that. And I think I think I like the way I laid it out. Second page, um, those top two bullet points go to the go to the second one. So consider Jephthah's vow, and I think this is going to help us out in in taking a look at it. Um, Jephthah's vow, what is arguable, is exactly how Jephthah fulfilled his vow. What are the two possibilities for how Jephthah fulfilled his vow? Okay, okay. the one is, Susan said it and Jim had referenced it, the, the one possibility is that he killed her. And burned her. What's the other possibility? That he Maybe. dedicated Never her to the Lord. Yeah, that like he did. Samson was. That yeah, that he Samson. dedicated her to the Lord, and somebody over here was saying, and and she didn't Never get married. Right. That was a part of that. Okay, so let's examine those two things. Okay, um, uh, and and by the way, there is there there is great deal of debate among Orthodox Lutheran theologians as to what happened here. Um, there, I, I, I know I differ with the interpretation of some. We can still be brothers. It's not, you know, it's not a doctrinal issue. It's not like we're debating, did Jesus really pay the full price for our transgressions? No, we agree on that one, you know. But, but this one, it's, you know, difference in interpretation. So let's examine it. Um, the, the next question is, what is the strongest support of each? So if someone were to say, I, I believe that Jephthah actually, you know, did his daughter as a whole burnt offering, the likes of which, you know, a sacrifice is, that it was a, a death and, and all of that. What's the strongest support for that? Well, Marilyn. Marilyn. Well, that vow was on his mind, and as soon as he saw her, he realized the vow he had made yeah. and the ramifications of it. It was his literal vow that he was going to do it, and man, it did bring him to his knees. Yeah. Other strong support toward that one, Susan? Well, the daughter says, since you said it, then carry it out. And even exactly as you said, right. I think that word exactly struck me. I should have looked at it in the Hebrew and figured out exactly what was there. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you. I think you made your, you know, that's the strongest arguments toward, toward favoring that interpretation. Um, now, what's the, what's the strongest arguments toward favoring the other, Nettie? I would say the Lord was abhorred by people sacrificing their children to Chemosh and some of these other gods. Yeah. So I, I mm. firmly believe that she was not burned. Yeah. Burned. Okay. So let's let's amass the support, and there's some good support. The idea of human sacrifice, particularly of your children, but the idea of human sacrifice that's pagan. That's, 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 that's what idols demand, not the Lord. Give me more. Jim. Well, the fact that, that, that she uh, wanted to uh, go away with her, with her friend and mourn the fact that, that uh, she would, she would uh, uh, remain a virgin. And, uh, yes. You know, and give me more on that. Yeah, at the end it says, was never intimate with a man. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, it actually, we have it in triplicate, don't we? By the way, let's, let's throw in one other strong argument for um, her, her dedication uh, as a virgin for all the days of her life. The fifth commandment. You know, the fifth commandment's pretty strong argument that he didn't do it. When, when the Bible says don't murder, you would think, yes, that applies to your daughter. <laughs> so, so that we were all assuming that, but let's put that on the table. Okay, so you got fifth commandment, you got the fact that it would be a thoroughly pagan practice. And you have, 
honestly a strong argument in the context and grammar of this passage. And, and let, me, let me strengthen that even a little further. In Hebrew, very often, if you don't know how to interpret something, take a look at the context. In poetry, it happens all the time. The poet says something and you're not sure what it means, but in the next phrase, he tells you what it means. You know, um, uh, maybe one right off the top of my head. Um, Lord, you're my rock, my stronghold, and my deliverer. What does it mean that God's your rock? That might be a little puzzling. But then when it goes on to say, my stronghold, my deliverer, oh, okay, that's what we're, it's not that God's a big rock, it's that he's, he's, he's your, your stronghold, your deliverer. And that, Hebrew does that all the time. Hebrew does that right here. Take a look at it, triplicate. Um, let's see. Um, Yeah, verse 37. Uh, she said to her father, do this one thing for me. Give me two months reprieve that I may go out into the mountains and weep. Not for my death. Not for the loss of a young human life. But for my virginity, I and my friends. Her father said, go. He sent her away for two months. She and her friends went and wept. Not over her death, which her friends surely would have wept over. That would have been the big issue. No, wept over her virginity there on the mountains. When the two months came to an end, she returned to her father. He carried out the vow that he had made regarding her. Namely, she was never intimate with a man. That was the content of the vow. You know, there's a period there, uh, what he had made regarding her. Put a colon there or a semicolon there. Because the, that, that next thing, he was, she was never intimate with a man. That's the content of, of his carrying out his vow. I, what, what you said, Nettie, that you were thoroughly convinced he didn't do it, I am with you, and I am thoroughly convinced that that's precisely what it was talking about. And we have a little bit even further evidence of that because we do know that there were women dedicated in, in that way. At the temple, there were, uh, well, at the tabernacle earlier in the temple too, there were women serving at the entrance and they, they, weren't, they weren't married women. The, the, the married women, would have, they'd have been assisting their husbands in their work. No, these were, these were virgins, you know, dedicated at the entrance to the tabernacle and temple. With the temple, I think they even gave their mirrors which would have been bronze, and they gave them as a gift to the Lord, and it got used for, uh, uh, it got used for um, it, it, something in the temple. So there were women who were virgins who were serving the Lord directly at his place of worship. She surely could have been one of those, you know. So I... I um, I, I'm also completely convinced. I, I think it's right in the grammar here. I think it's glaring. Mr. Dufresne. To so me, the weirdest thing is, like... Yes, by the way, yes, do bring, do bring Esther over here, because look at her hair. Is that cute or what? Esther, do you think I could do that with my hair? She's like, that man is silly, Daddy. Okay, now, please go ahead, Mr. Dufresne. To me, it's weird that it never says that he, like, inquired of the Lord. Yeah. You know, he had like two months. Surely he'd be like, there's got to be some way. Yeah. Like, yeah. But it doesn't say that he did that. Or In that. other words, had he offered her as a whole burnt offering, you'd expect it would say something like, and Jephthah pleaded every day, Lord, give me another answer. Right. And it doesn't. Yeah. So I, I think that's collateral evidence. By the way, we have just uncovered my first known disagreement with the, uh, the interpretation of the EHV Study Bible. Yeah, the EHV Study Bible, and it, it's, it's understated, but the EHV Study Bible says the, the most straightforward way to understand these words is that he offered his daughter. The time of the judges was a very bad time. That's the sort of thing that was happening. And 
I get that, and if anybody, you know, if anybody wants to, to think that that was true, we, you know, maybe Jephthah did do that. We're not supporting human sacrifice, but if they want to think that he did, I just, the way, the way I know the Hebrew Old Testament and Hebrew in general, this is just so glaring. They, why the mention of the virginity? That's, that's no issue. If she's dying, that's like nothing. But if that is the vow, then you mention it three times, including as, as, a, as an appositional statement at the end, which is exactly what happens. Susan. Um, I just have a question about vows in the Bible. If you did break a vow with the Lord, what would the Lord have done to you? That is, I, I should have gone and studied that again more carefully. Because I'm thinking that if, if he kind of um, reworded his vow, let's say, I'm just going to not let her ever get married, maybe the Lord said, okay, that's fine, I'll accept that as a fulfillment well, of the vow. Well, I mean, and I think he wouldn't even have to reword it. What, what's the meaning of the whole burnt offering? The whole burnt offering is, I'm taking this, and I am completely dedicating it to the Lord as I am completely dedicated to the Lord. That's exactly what he did with his daughter when, when he handed her over. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Utek. Is there another possible lesson we could draw from this for parents? Oh, there's a lot of lessons. To, we haven't gotten there yet, but please do. I, I think of, like, at a baptism, you know, we pledge to raise our children in the ways of the Lord. And the most important thing in life is to be faithful to your God and your Savior. And then when our kids start living together in sin, we go like, well, I don't want them to be mad at me. I'm not going to say anything um, because they might not come visit us anymore. So uh, I see so many parents roll over and they just let their kids kind of slide into gross sin and, and will probably lose their faith because... They just don't honor their vow, if you want to call it that, or their pledge at the baptism. By, by the way, coming from the mouth of a man who, who, has, who has lived faithfully what he just spoke, and not in regard to you, you're talking living there, not that, but you, I know that you've, you've looked a child, children of yours in the eyes and said, this was, this was not what that vow was about. So thank you. Marilyn had her hand up. Well, it brings up to me the question of which do you love more, the giver or the gift? She obviously, I mean, his daughter obviously was a gift to him because it was his only child. You know, a big point is made of that, you know, and how often don't we do something for our children? Oh, but maybe, maybe we weren't loving God more when we did that. I appreciate that application. Um, I, I got a couple more of them, and maybe maybe first uh, we can we can broaden it out and just talk about vows, right? Um, so that, I mean that's all down here too. What's not arguable is that this vow was a rash one. Okay, whichever way you cut this, okay, it was a rash vow. Um, what vows do we make nowadays? Mister Utek mentioned one. At baptism, the child doesn't make a vow. God actually does. I have washed you. I adopt you. I am filling you. God, God does that, but parents do, right? Uh, and and sponsors do. By by, you know, they call upon God as their help and their witness. That's what a vow is. Call upon God by name, uh, as your witness and your help that you're going to do something. Okay. And, and at baptism, parents and sponsors do. They say, with God is my witness and my help. Um, parents, I'm going to bring this child up to know what this baptism meant according to God's word. Sponsors, I'm going to help do that. Yeah. Give me more vows. Confirmation. Confirmation. We make vows. That's, that's an interesting one, too, because now confirmation... I think it really is fair to say we we Lutherans understand the big deal with confirmation is the the years of instruction leading up to it. Okay, um, the 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 two years, the three years, you are intensely studying God's holy word. But those vows, 
They're, they're important. And, and they're, they're serious. You know. And, and you do. You, you say at that point, you say, with God as my witness and my help, I will continue in his word until, you know, death parts me, or brings me to him. Parts me from this world, brings me to him. Give, give me some more vows. Marriage. Marriage, yeah, you got wedding vows. So in there, you're saying, with God is my help and my witness, I will remain with this woman, with this man, uh, in, in, marital, uh, in, in marital union until death parts us. More? In a courtroom? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it is, even if we might call it an oath or whatever, it's still, by whatever name, it's a vow. You know, you're, you're calling upon God as your help, your witness that you're going to tell the truth. Courtroom. A couple more? Are you going to service? Yeah. Tell me about that, Gary. Because I, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, but... but well, yeah, we got to, uh, almost like the president and, you know, on inauguration. Ah, you've mentioned two. Thank you. Oh, yeah. 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 So you've got uh, political office and you've got military. And, and Gary, thank you for mentioning that because um, I, I've had people um, mention that before and then I, I've said, oh, I mean, do you really put your hand on the Bible, take a vow? Not on the Bible, I don't think. Okay, but, but still, you're making a vow with God and, and of course it's however you understand, God, but um, with, with God, as my witness and my help, I will, I will um, battle to uphold the Constitution of the U.S., really, is what you're saying. And I, I wasn't sure whether that was a, a part of military. Thank you for corroborating that. I thought it was, mm -hmm. but thank you for corroborating that. Obviously, political office, yeah. You know, it's, it's president, vice president, but it's more. It's the cabinet members and stuff, too. That uh, that have to you know God is my help and my witness. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uphold the Constitution of the U.S. Boy, some of them are in trouble. I mean seriously. Maybe one more we haven't quite mentioned. Citizenship, I think so. And um, also ordination installation. Yeah. So I think you're probably right. Uh, with citizenship, that and thank you. I've never thought of that one before, and I'll I'll have to find out more about that one. Um, but uh, let, I'm just going to put pastors and teachers because that's shorter. Yeah. But um, ordination, installation, um, and and it's you you have your pastors and your teachers saying, you know, um, do, do, do you acknowledge that the Bible is the true word of God? You, you know, yes. Will you? to the best of your ability, proclaim that, um, yes, and I ask God to help me, you know. Um, and those are powerful things. Uh, sometimes when you're a pastor, it, you, you're, you're tempted to wimp out. You, you got a, a sermon text and you know, a really good example is you know it teaches that the papacy is the Antichrist. So do you preach that? Knowing you're, you may get blowback, <laughs> Some of well some, did. yep, yep. You you yeah. When you know when uh, when Catholic relatives are getting their kid baptized and they're walking out of the ten forty five service, this happened on Reformation in the year twenty oh one. Not that I not that I remember it like it was yesterday, though it was twenty years ago. Anyway, um, a pastor can say to himself and to you, you. You demanded that I do that, and I promised with God as my witness to do that. You, you, you said, do you, uh, do you accept the Lutheran confessions as true expositions of the word of God, and do you promise to proclaim the, twos, the truths contained therein, which was probably the language it was when I was ordained. Um, and we say yes, and, and may God give me strength, you know. So those, those vows, they're, they're powerful, they're helpful. The confirmation vow is a pastor really can go to someone that he confirmed and he can say, you made a promise 
with God as your witness and your help. And I am intending to keep you, hold you to that promise. And it's good for you, <laughs> you know, to hear God's word and to trust Christ and to live a godly life. So that's a little on vows. Uh, maybe just to draw one thing to a close, what does the account teach us about our vows? We had better fulfill them. Jim, your word, and I might put in the last word. Just wondering, if, do they still require the pastors and teachers, like in Elka and uh, the Moravian Church hmm. and these other churches, that to faithfully teach according to God's word? Because they ain't doing it. Yeah. I don't know. Does anybody have any experience where you happen to be in on a service like that? Um, in ELCA or Moravian Church or something where there was an installation where they, where they pledged to the Word of God. I doubt it. I, I, don't, I don't imagine that's even a part of it for them. No. Yeah. No. Susan. Well, well, and I think that maybe like in a Lutheran church was recent, they don't call all the, I think they hire some that they don't have to be Lutheran. They... They, they yeah, them. no, that's true. Right, I mean, so I don't know. so the, the, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm next to certain that in the Missouri Synod, the pastors, they're, and, and the, they have to take the, the vows we do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm next to certain of that. that I, I think you're right on the teachers. See, our teachers, our teachers were specifically trained to be Lutheran educators, not just educators who happen to be Lutheran. Mm -hmm and some of them not in the Missouri Synod. Mm -hmm. Okay, but our, our ed educators, among whom are some of you, um, are, are Lutheran educators, and, and you, we, we hold you to those, those same vows, you know. Um, yeah, but in Missouri Synod, no, they, they distinctly have people teaching in their schools who I certainly weren't trained the way our teachers were at a place like an MLC or a DMLC. But on top of that, in many cases, are not even Lutheran. Yeah, it's a different thing there, and it's too bad. Do not, do not lose sight of the, of the treasure our school is. Oh, may God preserve it as, as, as until Christ returns. Okay, so, um, by the way, one other little thing... So what does this say about our promises? Different from a vow, right? A, a vow, you're calling upon God as, as your help and your witness. But you know, as Christians, a part of our character is we want to follow through on our promises. Um, I'll soliloquize a little bit, then we'll go into a little different subject. But um, be careful about the promises you make. Only make the promises that you are confident that with, with God's help you can fulfill, you know? Be, be people who can be counted on that way. Even if it doesn't involve a vow, you know? Um, uh, my, my, my dear and lovely wife has gotten used to the fact that I don't make you a lot of promises, but when I do, I think I always come through. But I, I'm really... some. It used to be, you, that would drive you a little nuts. Huh? You know, it's like, well, t tell me, you'll do it. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how my schedule's going to fall. I really can't promise that. I will try, you know. But, but when, when you make a promise, you try to fulfill that. Try to be, you know, that straight up. Help. Re reputations are built on how you keep your promise. Yeah, yeah. And I think you can learn that from the idea of vows. Let me shift it. Uh, we're still, by, by the way, we've got a chapter to go, but that second chapter is the, the minor player today. Chapter 11 was the big deal. And I do want to deal with that, that first bullet point, too, because it's significant. Um, consider Jephthah's, uh, first, Jephthah's treatment of Ammon. What did he try first? Talking, yeah. yeah. Negotiation, diplomacy, yeah. yeah. Why is that wise? Whether it's nations or people. Always first, best to, to try talking, diplomacy, negotiation. Why is that wise? Avoid 
avoid conflict? Yeah, you might, you might avoid war, you know. And even if you can't avoid war, because a lot of times you, you, you start the, you, you know going into the negotiations, this ain't gonna work, <laughs> you know. But it does give you, if you will, the moral high ground, because you tried. They can't say you didn't try. They can't say you attacked for, no, you tried, okay. Uh, how did it turn out for Jephthah? Did diplomacy work? No. Uh, totally not. What does that teach us? Not always does diplomacy work. Some people, th some people I think in our government think that. I think they think there should never ever be a war because if you just talk nice enough, you can avoid it. Well, that's stupidity. Right. You know, because there, there's something called original sin and we all have it and you know, there, Jesus said you'll always have wars, you know. So, um, so it's not always going to work on a national basis, on an individual basis. Um, anyway, somebody does some damage to your property, apply this lesson. Talk first. Be diplomatic first. Sue later. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe you just let it go. Now, Here's something I wanted to get to. How good was Jephthah's grasp of Israel's history? Pretty good. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Estimable, huh? Yeah, it was, it was really remarkable. And I, this wasn't what happened in his lifetime. This was three centuries earlier he knew this, okay? Um, and of course, it benefited him greatly uh, as he, he laid out the case to the king of Ammon. So we, it, it shows there are blessings to knowing our history as a nation. Um, and and uh, let's talk about that just a little bit. What are the biggest blotches on the historical record of the USA? And, and I, want, I want to steer you a little bit here. Don't, your, your first thought, God, God bless you, because I can't deny it, your first thought might be abortion or, or it might be you know, homosexual marriage, or it might be our massive debt, or it might be transgenderism. Don't, don't think that way. Think historical record. Probably almost every American could almost sort of agree on a couple of blotches. Slavery. Slavery would be one. Maybe the other one? How we got our land? From oh, yeah. 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 I, I think, and you know, I think, honestly, I think liberal or conservative, probably we could kind of all agree that that's, historically speaking, those are, those are the blotches. Um, and and uh, what should we learn from them? Not to do them, yeah. Let's not get back to slavery. Let's not get back to robbing our land. By the way, just a little tidbit on that, which will show for you my conservative credentials, okay? Um, those are absolutely blotches on our historic record. Do realize that slavery, that was the 58 centuries before it, too, in every nation. Who put an end to it? Yeah, so, so you know, Praise God for some wise and brave people who 150 years ago put an end to that. Um, same thing with, okay, how did we get our land? Well, how did anyone get their land? They, they stole it from others. It, I mean, at least ever since about the time of Tower of Babel and Abraham and stuff like that. Um, we at least owned up to it and have done certain things to, to, to make up for it. I mean, but by that I mean um, like Native American tribes, they are their own nations. Mm -hmm. there, there is a whole lot of self-government they can do. <laughs> You'll enjoy this, so I'll tell it to you. My, my dad, you know, we lived up in northern Wisconsin. There are indigenous tribes up there. And my dad said, he said, they massacre the wildlife. He said, he said, if, if they're allowed to set their own seasons, then they got to use the same spears and bows and arrows that they did back then. I mean, they're taking, out, they're taking out regular deer rifles and they're saying, we can make our own laws, he says. 
you, you know, that ain't quite right. Uh, but point, point being, it's good to learn from your history, even the bad parts, and, and, um, and hopefully we have. By the way, the next one's an intriguing question. I ended up, I thought, discerning a pattern. Um, what are the shiniest spots on our historical record as a nation? Allowing immigrants to come here. It, you know, yeah. It was, it was good for us, but, but I mean, we, yeah. we welcome them. I, I think welcoming immigrants, yeah. And think, think of how it was. I mean, first, I, I, guess, I guess it was a lot Englishmen who, who started things up, but then there were Irish and Germans, and later it was more Eastern Europe, and now it's shifted to, um, you, you know, Latin America, I think, a little bit more, but kind of throughout the whole world. Fred. Oh, yeah. Guaranteeing and protecting personal freedom. Yeah. Of religion especially. Yeah. Um, our founding fathers, they weren't all Christians, but pretty many of them were geniuses. They just really were. Nobody did anything like we've done until the U.S. did it in 1776. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing document, and particularly for the sake of the freedoms. I have a different pattern I'm going to throw in. Let's see if Jim gets it, but otherwise I'm kind of well, first in Europe during the, during yeah. the first and Second World War. I mean, think of all the men we sacrificed for those people. Our shiniest moments. World War II, beaten Hitler. Um, Cold War, beaten beating the USSR, don't you think? That's something some of us saw, you know, when in, in fall of 89, when all those mm -hmm. Eastern European regimes were, yeah. were dropping, I was, I was, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I thought I was never gonna see that with my eyes. Yeah. Uh, and, and that happened. I'll throw in 9-11. And, and, you know, year 2001, and I mean, we did tamp down for at least a time the threat of Islamic terrorism. And what's the message there? When America, and often it's on the basis of a consciousness that we have a little different God than Hitler did, and we have a little different God than the atheistic Soviet Union did. And we have a little different God than, than, than Allah. When America realizes that and unites to act, wow, wow. Let's hope we have it when, uh, when, when the next one comes up with China. Oh, did I just say that? <laughs> I think it's probably true, right? But, you know, but, but will there be enough people agreeing that you know, agreeing together to, you know. We, we, people debate whether we were a Christian nation or anything, and it depends on your definition, right? I mean, uh, we, you didn't have to be a Christian to be an American. But on the other hand, historically speaking, we were the biggest Christian nation on earth, and probably still are by title, right? Um, and, uh, you just wonder, are there enough left that the next time conflict comes up that we're strong enough to unite enough to defeat that, or no? I guess we'll find out, won't we? And, uh, and either way, God's going to have his way, and the whole thing may come out stronger on the other end, huh? It did several times before. Um, we're at 5 o'clock. I see no hands. So how about I do take chapter 12? Uh, chapter 12 kind of, um, kind of a little bit quickly. Um, uh, I'm going to read verses 5 through 7. But what happens now is that uh, Ephraim gets ticked off at Jephthah. Ephraim keeps, keeps getting tick, ticked off, okay? <laughs> Ephraim's kind of hot-headed. Um, Ephraim, by the way, is going to be the dominant tribe of the northern kingdom, so much so that a couple centuries down the line here, 
Um, when you're referring to the northern kingdom, they may refer to it as the northern kingdom or Israel or Samaria for the capital city, or sometimes just Ephraim. <laughs> Even though there are nine other tribes, so dominant is Ephraim that they call it the northern kingdom Ephraim. And the Ephraimites say to, to Jephthah, hey, you should have called us out. We want a part of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the bounty. We, 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 we want a part of the glory. And Jephthah brushes him off and says, I was in the middle of a war. You were free to join. You didn't want to. But the Ephraimites treated them even you know, more brusquely with their words. They said, you're, you're renegades, you people over on that east side. You don't even have part in Israel. Well, Jephthah didn't take well to that. Uh, verse, well, let's start with verse 4. Uh, so Jephthah summoned all the men of Gilead and waged war against Ephraim because Ephraim had attacked. So the Ephraimites, they're on this side now attacking, and, and Jephthah summons the, the Gileadites and wages war against them. The men of Gilead struck down Ephraim because the Ephraimites had said, you Gileadites are nothing but renegades from Ephraim and Manasseh. The men of Gilead captured the fords across the Jordan that led to Ephraim. So the Ephraimites get beaten, now they're slinking back into their territory, but of course they gotta find the shallow spots in the Jordan to do it, and all the Gileadites are there. So, uh, whenever an Ephraimite fleeing from the battle said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead asked him, are you an Ephraimite? If he said no, they said to him, please say brook. If instead he said book, because he couldn't pronounce the word correctly, they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 from Ephraim <laughs> fell, which, which is a gigantic amount. Um, not many centuries before this, the average tribe was 40, 50, 60,000. Now, probably that had grown, and probably there were Ephraimites left, but 42,000 down is a lot of people. By the way, that brook book thing works really well because <clears throat> the word shibboleth means brook. And of course, they couldn't say shibboleth, they said sibboleth, because they, you know, well, it's, it's almost like say brook, book. <laughs> That's kind of the way it worked. Uh, and then there was a ninth judge, Ibzan. Uh, he was a wise guy. He had 30 sons, made sure they married outside the clan. 30 daughters made sure they married outside the clan, so he doubled his inheritance, but he died. Then the 10th judge, Elan, judged and died. Then the, that's all there is for Elan. Uh, the 11th judge, Abdon, uh, he had 40 sons, 30 grandsons. They rode on 70 donkeys. <laughs> but he died too. And that's the end of the chapter. Uh, law, I, I liked uh, verses one and two for law and gospel, uh, verse one for law. At that time, the men of Ephraim were called to arms. They crossed over to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, why'd you cross over to wage war against the Ammonites, but didn't invite us to go with you? We'll burn down your house with you in, with you in it. Have you ever gotten hot-headed like that? At least in your mind, at least stewing to yourself, oh, what they did to me, I can't wait to get, get, get after them. And maybe you pulled yourself back, but God sees what it is we do in our hearts besides uh, what it is that we do uh, in, with our hands. So that's the law. How about this for gospel, verse 2? Jephthah said to them, I was a man involved in a bitter dispute. I and my people against the Ammonites. I called you to out to arms, but you did not rescue me from their hand. You didn't, but somebody did. And that somebody was the Lord. And that's so true of us, right? We've defeated Satan too, who rescued us from his hand. It was the Lord. Um, it was Jesus who defeated him. Um, we're a part of the victory, but we sure can't take credit for it. Um, did you have questions on 12? If not, I had comments, but go ahead, Jim. No, 
not 12, but 11. Um, in almost every case before God sent a, the uh, the enemy to punish his people, he, all, he, he always introduced that by, 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 by saying why. They, they fell away. They were worshiping idols. They, you know, they turned against the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent. Now, in this, in the, in this case, that's not mentioned about the Ammonites. But actually, actually, it it is because it's it's there. Um, it's there at the end of chapter ten. And, oh, and, oh, yeah. We just didn't cover it today. Um, chapter ten, verse six. Once again, the people of Israel committed evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and Ashtardes. A um, little later, a uh, uh, little later, it says, verse 7, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the Ammonites. So it's, it's their intent. And we just don't get the deliverer until 11. Yeah, so. But thank you, because that cycle is still intact with Jephthah. Yeah. Um, they committed idolatry, chapter 10, verse 6. Uh, God handed them to the Ammonites, chapter 10, verse 7. God raised up a judge for them, chapter 11, verse 1. God delivered them, uh, chapter 11, verse, uh, well, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse um, 33. So the cycle's there. It's just spread across a few chapters. Yeah. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad you kept us to that because that is a theme. Um, let me give you one minute on my thoughts on uh, that, that last question. Uh, the obvious application of chapter 12 lies in Ephraim's actions and their consequences. What was Ephraim's cause for anger? Uh, they, uh, they, they wanted in on the uh, plunder and they wanted in on the glory. In what ways was it wrong? Well, they had failed to be so brave when uh, Jephthah called them out. How is it a cautionary tale for us? Let us make sure that we don't deal as hot-headedly with others as the Ephraimites did. And then I, I thought an application would be um, uh, your family member unfairly maneuvers himself into an, a financial advantage. That was it. Jephthah didn't do that. His wasn't unfair, but, but let's apply it in this situation. Family member unfairly maneuvers himself into a financial advantage in regard to an estate or an inheritance. Apply Ephraim's lesson. Maybe you don't get hot-headed. Maybe you don't go all out war. Maybe you don't lose 42,500 of your own people. Maybe you choose to be wronged rather than to do wrong. Sometimes that's the godly thing. Sometimes not, but be open to it. It's not, it's not our aggrandizement or our wealth at all costs. It just can't be. We're Christians. You know. So that struck me as maybe an application. Comments, questions? Here. I just recall a time that I um, had a conversation with a gentleman that talked about abortion, about the right to abort because the child was not normal. And I explained my position on that, and uh, he just totally refused to accept that. So I was looking at the 29 um, verse here, Spirit of the Lord came upon to have the, the, you know, after he, he didn't, wasn't listened to, the spirit interacted. And that's the way I felt. Prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to intervene. That's a uh, that's good application. I think so many times, everything we listed there, you think about it at the moment, <laughs> but then when you walk away, it's gone, and you gotta remember to recall through prayer. I like that application so much. I'm not going to comment. I'll let it stand. <laughs> Anything else today? Remember, we don't meet next week. That's all right. Enjoy your turkey. And two weeks from now, we do meet Samson. 
Uh, we will conclude by singing 236 stanza 5 and praying. <laughs> Then come before his presence now, and banish fear and sadness. To your Redeemer pay your vow, and sing with joy and gladness. Though great distress my soul befell, the Lord my God did all things well. To God all praise and glory. Now I remember why I picked that hymn, To Your Redeemer Pay Your Vow. Yes, and we will pray exactly in that regard. Jesus, thank you for keeping your vows to us from all of eternity. Uh, how you selected us, how it is that you died for us uh, and rose in glorious triumph. Now help us to keep our promises and our vows as well. In your mercy, uh, make our marriages strong, uh, cause us to be strong, faithful, godly parents. Uh, lead us to follow you as we vowed to do uh, at our confirmations. And Lord, in your mercy, uh, give us a great thanksgiving. You've given us a lot to be thankful for. Uh, and bring us safely back to study more of your word. Amen. Thanks, everybody. You can look forward to two weeks from now and three. Samson is very interesting. <laughs>